Okay, we're live. Greetings, everyone. I'm Monica Rhodes, and it gives me great pleasure to introduce my new video series, Three in the Possible. As we know, histories are often multi-layered, and the name of this show is no exception. So if you're a spades player, then you know this is the phrase you would say when you are predicting how many books you will win. It also represents the essence of cultural preservation, which is not just a conversation about the past, but one that concerns the future as well. Three and a possible is predictive. And finally, through this series, I will be chatting with experts in the preservation space and asking three and possibly four questions per interview. This is a free flowing conversation with my community of practice so without further ado, welcome to Three and the Possible. So today I am joined by my friend, Dr. Joy Kennard, who is a superintendent at Alabama's Tuskegee's Airmen National Historic Site, Tuskegee Institute National Historic Site, and the Selma to Montgomery, Montgomery National Historic Trail. Kennard's 20 year plus career reflects an abiding interest in the preservation and advancement of stories pertinent to African-American history and American heritage. She has held multiple leadership roles, including her current four-year tenure as the first superintendent of Colonel Charles Young, uh, Buffalo Soldiers National Monument, uh, but she's in Alabama, so, but she was the founding superintendent of Colonel Charles Young. Uh, she also was the district manager at the National Capital Park's East Central Di District, uh, where she managed the Mary McLeod Bethune Council House National Historic Site. Uh, the National Archives for Black Women History, and Carter G. Woodson's National Historic Home. Uh, among other units, an assignment as Acting Chief of Interpretation, Education, and Cultural Resource Manager at the Martin Luther King Jr. National Historic Site, the Oxen Hill Farm, Fort Washington Park, and Wolf Trap National Park for the performing arts. She also served as a park ranger, at various sites in Virginia and Maryland, educating visitors on the stories of prominent figures in American history, including George Washington, Frederick Douglass, and Robert E. Lee. A scholar of African-American history and culture, Kennard contributed to the seminal African-American National Biography Encyclopedia and published her first book, The Man, The Movement, The Museum, The Journey of John R. Kennard as the first African-American director of a Smithsonian Institution Museum in tribute to her father in 2017. She has taught African-American history, U.S. history to 1877 and other courses as an adjunct professor for seven years with the University of the District of Columbia's Department of History and was a lead curator on Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated, celebrating a century of sisterhood, scholarship and service commemorative ex exhibition. Kennard holds a bachelor's degree in social work and sociology, sociology from Livingstone College and a master of arts degree in history and a PhD in US history with a minor in public history and Caribbean studies from Howard University. She has also studied race relations abroad in Canada, England and France. So Joy, we go back a ways. We do. Beautiful we do. career here we and do. I'm so happy to have you join me for a conversation today. Thank you, Monica, for having me. Yeah. I am so happy to be here having this conversation with you. Let's get into it. I'm Let's get into it. it. Let's get yes. into it. Yes. So, Joy, my, my first question is, how, what experiences or events led you into the field, into the work that, that you're doing? How did you get started? You know, Monica, it's uh, a unique story I have. Um, I grew up in Washington, D.C., as you know, uh, you're a good friend of mine, you know my story. Uh, grew up in Anacostia, grew up in the Anacostia Museum that my father started in 1967. Grew up around the movement. My parents were um, uh, uh, entrenched in the NAACP um, in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, uh, fighting for uh, for um, apartheid, the end of apartheid um, in the 80s or so. Grew up around that, you know, grew up around me and my sisters going to John Kanye's office with my father, John Lewis's office with my father, young, you know. And so I um, 
feel like leadership has always been a part of the uh, makeup of, of who I am, who my sisters are, who my parents are uh, in their legacy. And so it's by no mistake that my father and his brothers were a part of the National Park Service when they were getting integrated in 1962. And so um, when I uh, was a freshman in college, my uncle told me, Joy, I got a job for you. And I was like, okay. And so we got me in a summer job at the Frederick Douglass home. Mm -hmm. It was the first job I had ever had in my life. And they paid me to talk, Monica, uh, <laughs> about a man I knew, uh, a man I lived down the street from his home and used to play on Cedar Hill, his property, roller skated on Cedar Hill, mm -hmm. uh, absorbed the air conditioning in, in the uh, heat of the DC summers with my sisters and my playmates. And so to have worked there to have been a stakeholder in the community and work there, it, it just helped me validate who I was in that community as someone who could give value in addition to the fact that I was learning about federal service and I was doing something that my family was proud of me of because of their connection. And so I loved it. I fell in love with it. Um, at first, I really didn't know the gravity of the position um, I had and what it could evolve into. It was just a job. But the more and more I came back every season as a seasonal uh, staff member, and when I graduated, they gave me a permanent job. Um, it just kind of took off my interest being seen. Um, as a young professional was something that was validating and affirming. And I just learned how I could really give back to these legacies of people who did so much for us. And so uh, reading Douglas's books, memorizing most of the, the passages, uh, memorizing some of his speeches even today helps to rejuvenate me. And so although it was a job, it was more like an opportunity for me to be more enriched mm -hmm. as a human being. And a lot of the experiences that visitors had that were life changing, I even had walking there. And so you, you maximize that by my other experiences in other national parks, like the Charles Young Buffalo Soldiers National Monument, like the Carter G. Woodson home, like the Mary McLeod Bethune home, like Tuskegee Airmen Institute in Selma to Montgomery. Uh, all these places just played a part in me being an affirmed human mm -hmm. and helping me in my journey as a leader evolving into someone who has done so much uh but using them as a blueprint even my father and a lot of things they went through has been an enormous factor in in shaping me and the decisions i make and the, the roles i've had so I've done so much. And sometimes I can't believe it. When you were reading my bio, I was like, my God, I did do that. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, Oxen Hill Farm, the work I did there, there's so many unique stories um, about the African-American experience in Southern Maryland, um, Fort Washington Park, uh, uh, Wolf Trap, uh, and the opportunities there for, for, for performances. There, I led a children's theater in the woods, hmm. one that I went to as a young girl. And it's amazing because uh, when I was there, I wish that we could have had uh, more children of color, um, uh, 
you know, even from indigenous communities, but that just wasn't the case. Um, a lot of the young people who came who were of color uh, were few and far between. But, you know, we had Dick Cheney's grandchildren and, you know, all of these uh, young people who did come, but it was just uh, eye opening for me to be in a space where the haves were and then going back to Anacostia where I live <laughs> where the have nots were in a multitude and just seeing the disparities within the park system which which shows how America is made up and mm. so it's just interesting all around but it, it helps to broaden my perspective yeah, I think that's a that's beautifully said, and thank you for just sharing some of your background and journey. Uh, you know, where our past intersected uh, was in D.C. at the Carter G. Woodson home, yes. and it you know it reminds me of the, you know a lot of the the work that you continue to do. You know, when when we first met, we were working on a partnership program, yes. and it's that's so important. So you know, Joy, right now you are the superintendent of three park units. Uh, you know, that is no small feat uh, in, 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 a, in a, they're geographically dispersed. And so I admire that. But what I also have admired uh, in working with you is your, your uh, ability to maintain and establish all of these partnerships. So could you say a little bit more uh, about your work around um, partnership building, coalition building, uh, and, and just any experiences or stories you have to share there? I'd love to do that, Monica. One thing that I will say is that partnership building is internal and external. Um, internal meaning that there's superintendents in the system that we want to help, we want to support. There are a lot of new parks who don't have things. There are a lot of new superintendents that um, need support. There are a lot of seasoned superintendents who have a lot and want to give back. And so there is uh, partnering within the system. And then there's external partnerships that um, is, it's just incredible. And to see the uh, culmination of how relationships can grow and lead to physical manifestations of success is just beyond um, what I ever thought could happen. And, and some of those things happened uh, when I was in Washington, D.C. Uh, with the National Council of Negro Women, this awesome organization Mrs. Bethune started in 1934. Um, uh, and and uh, through the leadership of Dorothy Height, we were able to do so many things at the the council house uh, in Washington, uh, working with the uh, Omega Psi Phi fraternity and Carter G. Woodson's home, uh, going to conferences with them, uh, helping us fundraise for things we need for his home. Uh, Carter uh, Carter G. Woodson also started an organization called the Association for the Study of African-American Life and History, which we still work through here today. Um, but when I was there at the home, we did so many things together. We celebrated Carter G. Woodson's birthday. We had major events that we worked together on, uh, going to the Hill together, working with Eleanor Holmes Norton, um, just trying to understand how we can um, have a mutually beneficial relationship, uh, working with the Omegas again at the Colonel Young home uh, in Wilberforce, Ohio. There also worked with Central State University, which is an HBCU, Wilberforce University, which is an HBCU, the school that uh, Charles Young started uh, the ROTC program um, straight out of West Point. That was a bad brother. He was incredible. And so I can't say enough about him. Uh, I will say, though, it is amazing how when I was there, 
I was able to read letters between him and Booker T. Washington. And they had this unique relationship that um, I just had never seen Booker T. Washington captured in this unique way, telling Colonel Young some of his innermost thoughts about blackness and where we could go as a people. And to be here in Tuskegee, preserving his home, working with Tuskegee University um, is something I never thought I would do. This is the university that my great grandparents went to, Monica. Not my grandparents, my great grandparents. They met here. And so looking at Booker T. Washington with a different lens, re-examining his contributions to uh, the South, um, the nation uh, globally, uh, it, it's, it's just unreal. And so these partnerships with the community, working with the mayor, working with the city council, working with the Tuskegee Airmen Inc. Um, who takes care of a lot of the last living Tuskegee Airmen. Their conference is coming up in August. Hopefully I'll be going there. And even working with Phi Beta Sigma, uh, George Washington Carver's historic laboratory is here on campus and part of my portfolio. And so he was a proud member of Phi Beta Sigma. So was Congressman John Lewis, who was a foot soldier in Selma and is revered for his work in voting rights. And so having these partnerships help to validate the work we're doing and helps to undergird and support the work we're doing through in-kind and um, fundraising. Mm -hmm. And so I can't begin to tell you about so many partnerships that um, have been cultivated before I got here and since I've been here. One that I'm um, really trying to cultivate now is with um, the descendant community in Africatown, the Clotilda. I know you've heard of that ship that's at the bottom of Mobile Bay. There's a documentary on Netflix about um, what happened and uh, the book that Zora Neale Hurston wrote <clears throat> when she um, was working for uh, Dr. Woodson. And so yeah. it's just incredible, Monica, um, yeah. what we're doing here. I know I'm forgetting something, but I tell you, I have been entrenched in so many things, working with the foot soldiers who walked from Selma to Montgomery who are still alive, working with Alabama State University. We have a center on their campus the Montgomery Interpretive Center. And um, we, we're just committed to the work um, of the American people, but with more focus on civil rights and, and, and um, just trying to get the story right. But sometimes, yeah. because sometimes we don't. Yeah, that's that's such an important important point, uh, Joy. And, and as I'm like hearing you, I think I'm hearing, you know, uh, Frederick Douglass, and I'm thinking about the National Association of Colored Women, right? Yeah. They started in 1896, who yeah. helped serve the home of Frederick Douglass. Thank I'm you. hearing Bethune. I'm thinking about the National Council of Negro Women. That's right. Um, also a member of Delta Sigma Theta. You know, uh, Old Mega oh, Sci Fi. Oh, yes. And, and Woodson, and you know, thinking about Paul Lawrence Dunbar in Ohio, yeah. and Carver and, and John Lewis, members of Phi Beta Sigma. So these are like, yeah. you know, these are hundred plus year old institutions here yeah. Um, yeah. that you are helping to steward their legacy in addition to the agency's work, which is a part of stewarding the legacies and these sites. I mean, those things kind of go hand in hand. Yeah. Uh, so, 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 just kind of putting these pieces together. I'm just kind of seeing these puzzles uh, all just kind of fit together nicely in your career. And to hear um, that uh, Colonel Young was talking with Booker T. Washington, yeah. and to find yourself, you know, not only establishing Colonel Young's, uh, you know, national monument in Ohio, but then, you know, being in Tuskegee. Um, right. 
to 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 be a part of that legacy. And, and even thinking about you know uh, Booker T. Washington's third wife, who was also a member of the National Association of Colored Women. Who oh were, my God! You know, yes, like Rosemary Washington. Yes, exactly. Omg, so she was so she was so she was incredible. Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah, oh, Margaret Murray. Absolutely. She did so much change agent work in Alabama, in Mississippi, in Tennessee, uh, in Florida. She did so much here in the South. She wanted families to be supported no matter what class. Uh, there's a book about her that recently came out mm -hmm. by Sheena Harris, who used to work here at Tuskegee. Okay. And and use the archives here to write her book and to see all of the things she did that she really never, she was only known as Booker T. Washington. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, when he was away, she helped to run this school. She yeah. helped it coexist. And she helped raise his children. They weren't her kids. She didn't uh, uh, have them naturally. These were children that were birthed from his previous wives who passed away. Yeah. So when you talk about um, uh, shock absorbers, when you talk about people who step in, um, when you think about people who are doing the work that um, behind the scenes to help make a, a better situation for people, she should be mm -hmm. thought of highly. Yeah. Um, I could go on and on about her. The school she helped her husband start, the um, uh, things she wrote. You know, she went to Fisk with uh, W.B. Du Bois, and they mm -hmm. were friends. And to have her husband be kind of not at odds, but publicly um, not. A difference of opinion. A difference of opinion. <laughs> Um, you can't imagine, I'm sure, what she thought um, in having to support certain things that, you know, she believed in, but may just have uh, different, slightly different views, like a lot of people did during mm -hmm. that time, but they supported both leaders. And so it's just incredible to, um, uh, to uh, work in a capacity to lift her up to. Um, yeah. because Booker T. Washington is so well known, but he was able to be well known and well thought of because of a lot of people behind him. Right. And this university here, Tuskegee was great because of his leadership, but because of the team he had assembled, mm -hmm. like uh, uh, um, uh, uh, Mr. T uh, Taylor. Uh, yeah, Robert R. Taylor. Washington. Yes, oh my God. Um, and these buildings are still in existence today uh, and create a blueprint for how we conceive of innovation um, on HBCU campuses. The Tuskegee Institute National Historic Site is the only national park on an active college campus. Hmm. Yes. And Incredible. so we look at the HBCU experience and how the um, industry change with agriculture and industrialization and how they led this charge in the South, which was extraordinary. Extraordinary. So stay tuned. That's, that's a number two conversation <laughs> for three and the possible. Right, right. Would, would, would you, I ain't gonna hold you, but I have one more question for you. Yes, and yes. so you're, you're doing incredible, incredible work down in Alabama and, and have done that over the course of your career. What, from your perspective, what do you see is the, is the future of, of this work? The, you know, the future of preservation, what, well, what, what should, what should we all be thinking about, uh, you know, 20, 50 years from now with, with the work that, that you're doing? What's the future of this field? Monica, the future of this field is, to invest in it, mm. learn how to yeah. cultivate what we have done in the past and how it needs to be cultivated. 
I know we're looking at how drones can be helpful to historic preservation. We're looking so much digitally at mm -hmm. how we can reconstruct things that used to exist. Uh, I think that is is good, but we still need to do what we used to do. Mm -hmm. um, do the oral histories. We still need to publish. We still need to uh, have the meetings face to face in the community. Uh, we still need to work in the vineyards of um, uh, the uh, issues we have in our communities with graveyards and yeah. cemeteries. Yeah. And, you know, we now there's more work, and some people don't want to do it in our field you know they want to be at arm's length in the community and mm -hmm. that is not how you have success you've got to go to community meetings you got to get fussed at you've got to <laughs> try to raise money you've got yeah. to have doors slam in your face you've got to be around and be there you've got to work with people who need the help there's so many churches when Selma had the devastation on January 12th, they still haven't rebuilt now. And it's 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 May. Um President Biden has been here, he has committed funds, but you know, you you have these people who are in our field who haven't even tried to help work with the people there whose homes were demolished who can't go back to their homes, historic homes, historic churches where uh, archives are that have been destroyed, you know, toppled over these examples of, of, of activism. And so we need to really look at climate change in a different way. We have to look at storms in a different way and how they can be destructive and learn how we can preserve places that used to exist because mm -hmm. of these storms and help fortify places that are fragile because of these areas that uh, can be dismantled because of storms through climate change. And so um, I see that being where the push should be in my yeah. opinion. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. And, and um, you know, what you were saying about stewarding the cultural legacy of these places, places, you know, oftentimes when when people say innovation, it, you know, they think it's like synonymous with like this new technology that's coming out. Right. Um, but, you know, thinking deeply and, and, and preservation is a, is, a, is a roadmap in some ways to both what we shouldn't do again and, you know, where we fail short as a nation, um, but then also where innovation happened and where we found right. something that really worked uh, and we sh and there's lessons to be learned uh, from from that. And I'm thinking about uh, you know Carver's uh, work that he did in, in Alabama and taking yeah. that science into uh, in, in, into the farmers' hands and putting that 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 information into their hands. Um, you know, I'm I'm thinking about the the work of uh, 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 Benjamin o uh, uh, Davis. Who, who yeah. was there, you know, I can just, oh, just yeah. thinking about these examples of we, the wheel doesn't need to be recreated every generation right. if we can do the work and learn from our past. Exactly. You know, preservation is an action word, Monica. Yeah. And I think we're so busy sometimes in a classroom learning about it. We have to be around it for these practical hands-on skill lessons but sometimes people don't really understand that it's more to it than uh, having book knowledge. You really got to be strong in this field. This field is not for the weak at heart. Well, well said, and you know, we can keep, we can talk for days on that, but we won't because Joy, it's been about a half an hour we've been talking. Stop. <laughs> girl, I'm just getting started. I'm just getting ramped up, girl. I, I know, I know, and and I also know that you have three national parks that you're running, and so you yeah. are a very busy woman. They calling me now, Monica. I, I know, but so Joy, thank you, thank you for your time today. It's thank always you. a pleasure to see you and talk with you.
Thank you, Mark. Uh, and if people want to connect with you on, on Facebook, LinkedIn, oh. how, how do they get in touch with you, Joy? They can contact me on Facebook. They can contact me here at the, the park. Um, they can email me here at the park as well, joy underscore canard at mps.gov. They can call me here too. I am available. <laughs> you know? All right, Joy. <laughs> All hey, right, you know, I'm a public servant, Monica. Yeah, okay, you're right. You're so right. You're in right. that capacity, I am available. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Doing work hours. <laughs> All right. Well, Joy, thank you again. I look forward to seeing you when I'm back. I'm coming down to Alabama to, to oh, see you. Alabama. It's so good to see you. Good to see you too. Yes. Okay. Well, thank you again, Joy, and we will catch up soon. All right. Thank, thank you, you all for joining in for the conversation today.